Hey guys, it's Cam from Craft and Tailored and this week's episode of what is on my wrist. It's kind of a hybrid version. We're gonna be talking about a watch that's on my wrist and we're gonna be comparing that to a watch that we're gonna be unboxing. So it's like a what's on my wrist unboxing video, I guess. Uh, the watch that we're gonna be talking about is the Benris Type 1 Limited Edition that was released this November uh, in 2020 by uh, the relaunch Benris Watch Company. Before we dive into the details and kind of do like an unboxing and a side-by-side -side comparison, what I wanted to do was provide you guys with a little bit of a historical overview and give you, uh, I guess, a basis of comparison and an understanding of the Benris Type 1 and Type 2. We have a great article that we put together called the Benris Type 1 and Type 2 Mill Sub. And um, it basically goes through the differences between what a Benris Type 1 and Type 2 is, the differences between the references, um, and it's kind of a good, I guess, historical overview of a watch that is becoming highly desirable and very much iconic. Let me just kind of break down really quick what a Benris is. It is one of the only US military issued dive watches that um, was created under contract outside of guys going out and being issued, I, I would say, other, other watches uh, under contract. So it's a watch that filled um, a contract that was known as um, MIL-W-50717. And it was a contract that was put out in the later part of or the early 1970s rather, um, to come up with a watch that could be used as a navigator's watch, but also a watch that could be used uh, as an issued dive watch for the US military. If you're not familiar with Benaris and Type 1s and Type 2s, as previously stated, these watches were, watches were manufactured by Benaris. And though it wouldn't be entirely fair to credit the timepiece's design entirely to Benaris, for reasons we'll kind of talk about in this video and now kind of explore, back in the 1970s, the US military effectively flipped the script on the military watch production uh, by way of outlining their needs in a dive watch with basically these extreme details through a document under this, this contract known as MIL W50717. Um, and in the past, off the shelf up to the task timepieces had been put to use. Um, and there were a couple of watches uh, that were created under contract, but nothing really was kind of like a dive watch. It was more of like a field watch variant of a watch that was ultimately issued to the US um, soldiers. We'll provide a link in the description below so that you can kind of like read about the the, the Benres um, Type 1 and Type 2 and talk about the, the contract and what was outlined in the contracts and stuff like that. For this video, what I wanted to kind of do was do an unboxing of the reissue by the Benres company and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the watch and then also compare um, the reissue to an original version. I've been a big fan of Benaris watches for a really long time. I love military watches, I like tool watches. I've had probably in my collection over the past number of years, had maybe three or four Benarises in my personal collection that have kind of moved in and out. And then within the Craft and Tailored shop, we're always looking for Benaris Type 1s and Type 2s. Um, and we've come across a good number of them that we've ultimately sold through our shop. So very familiar with the reference, a big fan of the reference, and um, a big fan of the watch. So let's do a little bit of unboxing here. I was really, really excited about um, this Benaris Type 1 project. I knew about the project early on. I've been a fan of Benaris Type 1s and Type 2s for a long time. I've had a lot of them in my collection. And so um, I was really excited for Benaris kind of to, I guess, get wind back in its sales and ultimately create something that was accessible and consumable and kind of maybe, I guess, a modern interpretation of something that I really love so much and something that has also become very uh, desirable and collector among the, the watch enthusiast community. Benaris Type 1s, when I first got into collecting, you could literally find a Benaris Type 1 for less than $1,000. Today, a Type 1 will sell for, I would say, anywhere between 10 and 12,000. Um, and that's a number that I think is going to increase. There's a very small percentage of them that are available. There's a lot of watches that didn't survive military operation or demilitarization. So the watches are becoming increasingly more rare and harder and harder to find. And then finding examples that are worthy of collecting are also becoming harder to find. So 
again, very excited about this watch and was really excited about this project. Um, so let's kind of do an, an unboxing. I have not worn the watch yet. Um, I've only kind of looked at it and put it on wrist and kind of looped it and all that kind of stuff. I am a, a watch nerd through and through. So when I got this, um, I was uh, pretty excited to receive this. I actually bought it through uh, Houdinki. Uh, so went onto the Houdinki site, just like anybody else and uh, bought the watch, paid full retail for it. This isn't like a paid endorsement or anything like that. Um, I, I really want want to support the brand and support things that I think are think are cool. The watch came in like a like a Houdinki box. There wasn't any kind of special packaging or whatever. I'm not a big fan of like massive watch boxes or anything like that because they end up taking up just a ton of space. And you know, what are you gonna do with a big watch box? It's like the Omega, uh, Speedmaster comes in like this big like NASA flight case thing and it just is like you're gonna wear the watch I guess it's cool to like unbox that and whatever but I'm not a big fan of like ASMR unboxing stuff I mean that's kind of the extent of my ASMR right there I fucking mic up I don't know so anyways watch came in just kind of a box thrown in there with some some packaging, wasn't really impressed with that at all. Um, and it came kind of like this. So there's like this, this outer sleeve. Uh, and I think that this is probably the outer sleeve for Houdinki because they use like a filament service to send all their stuff. In this sleeve, you have kind of this like little olive drab envelope. It says Benris on the outside like this. And then you have the Benris, I guess, like seal on the on the back side. So this kind of like zippered pouch. We'll kind of unzip this guy here. So we're gonna unzip our, our pouch. It's kind of like more of like an envelope. And then inside we've got our, uh, our watch and then like a little like sleeve here with some instructions and stuff. And I'll go through that. So it says like quality control certificate. It's signed off by a guy, I guess. And then we have like this type one instruction booklet. Two year limited warranty. I guess it kind of opens up like this. It talks about setting the time and all that kind of stuff, right? Okay, so glad we're all on the same page there. So kind of kind of nice, I guess. Like I'm not really I'm not buying the watch for necessarily the packaging or whatever, but uh, it's there. So uh, let's open this guy up. So here's the watch. Uh, it has like a little protective sticker. Let's remove the sticker. Let's get that on the ASMR. I don't think that is gonna do anything. And we got one on the back. Let me try that. Oh God. How's this for ASMR? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, then we got like this little hang tag, this little thing. Um, so first impression of the watch, now that I've put fingerprints on it. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's cool, I'm not, there's a couple things that, that I noticed that are different right away. Um, the bezel's really cool. So the bezel is uh, your kind of navigator style or GMT bezel. Um, you have 15 minute intervals, similar to the original, which I'll show you here. So this is a type uh, two that I sourced from the son of the original owner. This one is from 1979, so towards the end of the production run. This watch I'll probably do a separate video on because it is so cool. This watch was um, worn, issued. I know the backstory of this and it has an interesting backstory. It's on the original strap, um, has a compass that was added by the original owner um, and has some other cool like documentation and stuff like that. But for comparison's sake, we'll use this as kind of like the, uh, the comparison. So obviously there's a difference between the type one and the type two. The type one basically has no numbers on the dial and is more, I guess, Submariner style in its, in its look and its design. But for comparison's sake, this is just what I have here in my collection. Um, and this is an original and there's a lot of crossover. So um, you can see that we've got, you know, an upgraded bezel. The bezel is, uh, is bi-directional, same with the original, so bi-directional bezel. Um, the overall look of the watch is very similar, but there are some, some noticeable difference right, up, right off the bat. Um, the lug width is 20 millimeters. The lug width on the original one, I think is 
It's like an in-between, it's like a 19.5, if that makes sense. These straps that were made for the Benrises are, are kind of like a weird, I don't have a set of calipers here, but a 20 millimeter NATO kind of pinches a little bit and an 18 looks too small. So I think it's like 19, 19.5 millimeters on these original kind of issued straps. And the original straps are really interesting. Um, they are like a single pass NATO strap. They're made out of this like very interesting kind of nylon material. It's not really like a like a fabric. It's more of like a, it's it's kind of its own thing. It's hard to describe unless you've really seen one or, or worn one. I think it's like kind of an early version of like a nylon webbing kind of military strap. So, um, and the hardware was always black on these guys uh, based on my knowledge. And um, you know, this is again, kind of the original version. So let's kind of go through this. Um, so there's a locking crown. One thing that you'll notice between the two is that um, there is no dash on the crown at all. So one of the things is that um, the case back here is a uh, basically a, a screw down case back as opposed of like a top load design of the original monoclock case. Um, and we were talking a little bit about that crown. That's the reason why on the originals you have this dash in the crown versus no dash here. I kind of would have wanted to see the dash here I think it's kind of a trademark to, to the watch. Um, whereas this doesn't have it, I get it. You know, you don't want to confuse watchmakers and, and all that kind of stuff, but um, it's not a, a monoclock top, top low design. But I think if we're making a, a true homage or a, a reissue, I think it should have had it. It would have been to me like Rolex not putting a coronet on the side of their of their watch, I think that this is a signature feature. And even though it's a technical element, I think it's something that I definitely look for when looking at vintage ones, because it's how you will know and understand if a crown has been replaced or not, is if it has that dash in the crown. So I, I get it from a technical version, but or a technical perspective rather. I think the dimensions and, and kind of the finishing for me are a little, uh, I don't know, lackluster. I was really disappointed in this. And if I look at it with a loop, you see a softness in this case. Uh, there's no hard lines. Um, one thing that really bothered me is if I look at the crown, there's an unevenness to like the, like the, uh, the, the crown guards that are built into the asymmetrical case. So all Benrises are, are asymmetrical. The crowns here, uh, the crown guard, the crown protector side of the case, uh, definitely has like a, a symmetry to it, whereas as this version here, it, it's kind of uneven, just looks a little bit sloppy to me. And the case feel just is, I don't know, lackluster. So that's one knock on on on, on the case. The other thing that I noticed too is that um, the bezel itself is made out of, I, I would assume like a ceramic and basically it has like, these etched um, numbers in a triangle at the 12 o'clock position. The originals were obviously like this Bakelite or acrylic material, and obviously uh, this isn't the best way to create a bezel because it becomes fragile, and if you knock it on something, you can crack it and break it and et cetera, et cetera. I think that the ceramic is, I guess, the modern upgrade, most sensible thing to do. But this is a feature set of the watch that I think really makes it what it is. And there are other companies that have, uh, you know, produced uh, bezels like this that are e even made out of sapphire that give that three dimensional look. So, um, you know, I think that that could have been done better. So um, another knock is that the, the 12 o'clock triangle on the bezel just is basically just loomed and it has like just this open loom. There's nothing that is sealing the loom based on what I'm seeing under loop. And also when I look at it under ultraviolet, it's just like bare loom in that triangle. So that inevitably over time, if you wear this in the water, if you actually push this watch and put, put it through its paces, like that's gonna come out. I think that, that, that there's probably gonna be some unhappy owners there. The hands, um, which are really, really nice, uh, they are, the loom is all over the hands. Uh, you know, this vintage version, the loom in the hands on this vintage version is actually better than the, than the modern version. Um, so one of the things that like really threw me and I, and I looked at all this under ultraviolet is on the minute hand specifically, 
there is a uh, basically a, a break in between the luminous material. And I think that that is for technical reason so that you can differentiate between the minute and the hour hand when looking at this underwater, but also because the hand is long and there's a lot of lumen there. So I feel that, you know, you probably need to have a section there to loom the hand without having the loom fall out. It looks like the hand was actually loomed from the top and not necessarily the bottom, which just doesn't make sense to me. My biggest knock on this watch is that it does not have fixed spring bars. Who's buying this watch, right? Are you buying this watch? Are you a military watch fan? Do you want an original type one? And are you not able to find one and or maybe not afford one? What, what makes a type one or any military watch cool? Fixed spring bars, no duh, right? So I get it that they were like, oh yeah, we're gonna make you know, a type one with removable spring bars, that's the most sensible thing to do. But in my opinion, the watch should have been made with fixed spring bars. That is like my biggest gripe on this. This is a military watch or an homage to that. It should have had fixed spring bars without question. I'm gonna get to my last gripe here. This uses an ETA 2681. What's interesting with an ETA 2681 is that is an automatic self-winding movement. ETA, Swiss made, right? So in the first position, when you unlock the crown off the case, I don't know if you can hear this, but that would be a date wheel clicking over and or the lever that would click over the date wheel, right? That to me doesn't make sense. It's a 2681. Why would you put a, a watch that has a date complication into a watch that doesn't feature date complication? That doesn't make sense. I'll be quite honest with you, when I got this, I was pretty let down. Um, the fit, form, feel, finish of the piece is, to me, a little bit lackluster. Um, I'm bummed that the that the case is cast and not milled. Correct me if I'm wrong, Benris, but this looks like a cast case. This is not a milled case. I'm not seeing any finishing marks on the case if it's milled. And if your bead blasting is that good, then call me because this, is a bead blasted case, but but it's soft. Like, is that a result of bead blasting? On wrist, the watch is nice. I don't like the strap that the that the watch came on. It's like a seatbelt style strap. I'm not gonna wear this watch on a leather strap. I don't think that you should wear the watch on a leather strap. Uh, you should wear it on a black or drab NATO strap. So the strap, if I'm reviewing just the strap, meh, okay. You know, it's just kind of, whatever, it doesn't fit my, I think I've got on the, on the bottom hole, I've got 6.75 inch wrist and I've got a lot of room in here. So this strap does not work for me. Another major difference is that this has uh, anti-reflective sapphire crystal and this has an acrylic crystal. I think it would have been cool for them to do uh, an acrylic crystal or a hazelite crystal, especially since, you know, if this watch is intended to be worn and used as a tool watch, you can buff out uh, a hazelite or acrylic crystal quite easily. I'm not saying that that it was it was a bad move by them. I think the, the profiling of the crystal is pretty spot on. What's interesting is that the one thing that they did get right is the profile between the bezel and the crystal. There's a seamless transition between the two. That's pretty freaking impressive. Pretty awesome. I do like the fact that they, they stayed kind of true to the original design. The loom on the dial is really, really nice. The hands are kind of meh. Um, I like that there's a gap on the top of the triangle. Nice, nice nod there. Um, overall, the watch on the wrist wears a little bit heavier because of the movement that was used. I think a slightly larger case and then ultimately um, a sapphire crystal as well. That adds weight to the watch. If I'm going to review the watch uh, on a scale of one to 10, I'm going to give everything that I got in this, I'm, I'm talking about everything, fit, form, finish, wearability, all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna give the watch probably like a 7.5 out of 10. Not a bad watch, but for the price point and all that kind of stuff, I think there were, there were some things that I think they could have done better. I think that they're probably making a, a good amount of money here. And the other thing too is, you know, this is a launch, right, for Benris to like come back into the modern era with one of the most historical watches that they that they ever produced. And I, as a as a collector, as an aficionado, as a guy who's had, you know, Benrus's in his collection, who still does have Benrus's in, in his collection, um, 
I think you should have probably put more energy into this. You, if you wanna make a splash within the market, you gotta do something that's great and checks all the boxes. And I think, again, we should have gone with fixed spring bars. You should have, like, this is an enthusiast watch. The guys that are buying this either want a type one or type two and can't afford one and want something that is more wearable or um, have them in their collections like me already and want something that is less precious and th that they can adventure with. Like my idea with this watch is like, let me go on an adventure with this. Let me go dive with this watch. Let me go up to the mountains with this watch. Let me live with this watch. And there are things here that kind of make me not want to do that. I'm, I'm hoping that Benarus is going to release other stuff. This could be like a flash in the pan for them. I think you can still get the watch at the time of this recording from Houdinki, so it didn't sell out. I think I'm going to probably wear my original Type 1s and Type 2s more. Overall, kind of lackluster, kind of like meh. That That's my, uh, my, my official review, meh, David, hashtag meh. <laughs> so any case, guys, I'll provide a link in the description below so that you can learn about um, the Benner's Type 1 and Type 2. We wrote, again, an article on that in our blog that's very informative. So if you're not doing so already, uh, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Craft and Tailored. If you've got watch questions, we're here and happy to help. Drop us a line at info at craftandtailored.com. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And as always, guys, thanks for tuning in. I will see you in the next one.